first section of the Sydney Newcastle Expressway, the first rural expressway in New South Wales, was officially opened by the Premier, Mr Askin, in 1965. Before the motorist could enjoy facilities such as these, many people in various occupations combined their knowledge and skills to plan and execute works of great magnitude. This is the story of those people and the job done by them. Sydney, now one of the world's largest cities, is the centre of commerce in the state of New South Wales. And there has always been a need for a connection between the state capital and Newcastle, the state's second city and big industrial centre, 100 miles to the north. Early access between the two cities was by sea. Road connection followed slowly with the old Putty Road in 1820. Wallumby to Singleton in 1826. Wiseman's Ferry to Maitland in 1829. Gosford to Maitland in 1841. And the St Albans route in 1844, all passing around the upper reaches of the Hawkesbury and its tributaries. In 1844, George Peat established a more direct route with a passenger ferry over the Hawkesbury at Mooney. Parts of this road, with its impressive stonework, can still be seen. In 1889, via Wiseman's Ferry to Gosford and along the coast to Newcastle. Later, the Wiseman's Ferry Spencer deviation was opened. The ferry and road served as the principal access between Sydney and Newcastle for many years. A shorter route via the Pacific Highway used a vehicular ferry over the Hawkesbury. The highway, with its easy grades and best possible pavement of the day, was hailed as a great engineering achievement and was a boon to motorists in the 1930s. The Peets Ferry Bridge replaced the ferry in 1945. With post-war development and the increased use of motor vehicles, the capacity of this road was soon outstripped. In an effort to keep pace with traffic growth, climbing lanes were added on steep grades. Visibility was improved to assist overtaking. A new high standard route of 20 miles in length provided further relief. This road bypassed Gosford. It became apparent that even with improvements, the existing routes could not be expected to keep pace with the anticipated traffic growth in the immediate future. An expressway was planned to link the two cities and provide a fast road to Gosford and the rapidly developing central coast. Initial work was between the Hawkesbury River and Calgar. Surveys were carried out preparatory to design and construction. Distances were determined by tellurometer, an instrument which measures length using reflecting radio waves. Targets were placed on survey points for control of aerial photography. Ground detail was recorded by flying over and photographing the targeted area, which was extremely rugged. The aerial photographs were scanned in a stereo plotter made available by the Lands Department. And ground details translated into contour plans. In the Department of Main Roads Drawing Office, the road location was fixed, a task made extremely difficult by the need to accommodate an expressway and a highway on the narrow, rugged, steep neck of land between the Hawkesbury and Mooney Creek. Steel splines were manipulated on the contour plans. Aerial photographs examined to achieve the best alignment. 
particular details were examined by constructing models from corrugated cardboard. The Abbott apparatus, comprising cardboard cross sections supported on retort stands, also assisted in the design. Detailed drawings were prepared. The final plans and specifications were then handed over to the resident engineer of the construction organisation. The expressway north of the Hawkesbury was built in three sections, from Mooney Point to Calgar and connecting with the new route to Newcastle. A contract was let in 1963 for the construction of the first section of just over four miles between Mooney Point and Mount White. This section included an interchange at Mooney Point. It was here at Mooney Point that work commenced. Engineers inspect the site at the start of construction. The first operation was to clear the area of timber which was felled mainly by chainsaw. of clearing was kept to a minimum and debris burned within the cleared area. Earthworks could proceed at full pace on section one of the expressway, four lengths of the existing highway had to be relocated, requiring the construction of two miles of road through very rugged terrain, which involved the working of heavy earth-moving plant in confined areas and on steep slopes. Material was moved from cuttings to fills by bulldozers and motorised scrapers. moving plant crossed the existing highway, it was essential in the interests of safety to control the flow of traffic. Rock ledges were removed by drilling and blasting. trucks transferred material from cuts via the existing highway to the fills. After spreading, the material was thoroughly compacted by rolling. Retaining walls constructed with local sandstone block or concrete crib units were required at some locations to support fills. The relocated lengths of highway were paved with asphalt before being open to traffic. were constructed concurrently with the relocation of the highway. At Mooney Point, a pre-stressed concrete structure was being built. This shows the completed Mooney Interchange Bridge. During construction, steel reinforcement cages for footings and columns were placed in trenches, previously excavated to solid rock. Concrete was batched at a plant near the expressway. Mixing was carried out in transit mixers during transport to each bridge site.
concrete was discharged from the transit mixers into hoppers for placing into formwork. Meanwhile, at Jarl's Lookout, two miles north of the Hawkesbury River, twin bridges, each of seven spans, were constructed. The narrow ridge between Hawkesbury River and Mooney Creek was not wide enough to support an expressway fill. Bridging was the economical solution. Transverse pipe culverts were constructed prior to commencement of full-scale earthworks on the expressway. Before excavating cuttings, the area was cleared of vegetation. The topsoil was removed and the rock was drilled at a quarter to one slope for pre-splitting with explosives to form batters. Softer rock was loosened by ripping and the cutting was excavated to median level. The median batters were drilled for pre-splitting. was drilled for loosening with explosives. And was removed from both sides simultaneously. The cutting was excavated to subgrade level, but the median was retained as a rock island. Before commencement of fills, the area was cleared of vegetation. Topsoil was removed and the surface benched at 1 in 10 slope to support the toe of the fill. Material was placed in layers 8 inches thick. The natural surface stepped or roughened in advance of each layer. A rock facing was provided four feet wide in advance of each layer as the fill progressed and the fill slope was generally one and a half to one. A sub-base layer 12 inches thick was placed above subgrade level using selected sandstone. On the first section of the work, two million cubic yards of rock had to be excavated and moved to fills. In the early stages, all rock was loosened by ripping. Later, it was supplemented by drilling and blasting. A series of delays introduced into each blast resulted in good fragmentation. A mechanical shovel of two and a half cubic yards capacity was used to load broken rock into trucks for hauling to the fill. Mid-1964, 12 months after commencement, work was well advanced over the full length of Section 1. To give the motorist a longer length of expressway at an earlier date, it was then decided to accelerate the project by proceeding immediately with the construction of Section 2, 1.6 miles long at Mount White, which included the Mount White interchange. One length of the existing highway required relocation. Section 2 was constructed by the Department of Main Roads by direct control and an engineering organisation and depot were established at Mooney. Operations were planned in detail using the critical path method to determine the most efficient programme for the work. A computer was used to assist with the analysis. Bar 
charts were produced for use in job control and for recording progress on the work. Earthworks were carefully controlled using survey instruments and coloured profiles to define batter slopes. About 50% of the rock was loosened by ripping, using the heaviest tractors available up to 425 horsepower. These tractors were fitted with rear-mounted hydraulic rippers using a single time. Material loosened by ripper was moved by motorized scrapers. These units were capable of carrying up to 30 cubic yards of material at 30 miles an hour. A typical team consisted of five scrapers with a tractor dozer push loading and one or two ripping tractors. was discharged from scrapers on the run and spread out in thin layers using bulldozers before being rolled. With this equipment, outputs of up to 10,000 cubic yards of earthwork per day were achieved. Rock which could not be economically ripped was loosened by drilling and blasting. two and a half inches in diameter were drilled using crawler track mounted drills capable of penetrating at more than one foot per minute. Holes were generally 14 feet deep but increased to 30 feet when rock strata was favorable. The explosive used was generally an ammonium nitrate fuel oil mixture prepared in small batches near the site. charge was primed with gelignite connected by instantaneous detonating fuse to electric millisecond delay detonators. To avoid misfires, detonator circuits were tested by measuring their electrical resistance. The shots were then fired. which was loosened by blasting was generally too large for moving by scrapers. So it was loaded into rock buggies or trucks for hauling to fills. A mechanical shovel was used for loading rock, but generally front end loaders of two to four cubic yards capacity were found more suitable.
fitted with rock rakes were used to separate the larger rocks. These were moved to the outer edge to form a rock facing about four feet thick on the fill slopes. This process provided a scour-resistant surface. The finer material remaining in the body of the fill was spread by bulldozer and watered to bring it to optimum moisture content. At this stage of the operation, sheep's foot rollers compacted the material to its maximum density to prevent later settlement. The action of this type of roller is to compact each layer from the bottom upwards. Each layer of the fill was tested in situ for density. Two methods were used. The sand replacement method involved the removal of a sample of material for drying and weighing. It was replaced by sand of known density to determine the volume. In the second method, a nuclear gauge determined density by counting gamma rays emitted from a radioactive source and backscattered by the fill material. Cut batters were cleaned down with crowbars and compressed air to dislodge any loose material which might later be a hazard to traffic. The top of the sub-base was carefully checked for level and shape. The surface of the sub-base layer was trimmed to preset levels by grader and the layers compacted by rolling. and steel vibrating rollers assisted with compaction. Earthwork was now well advanced throughout the whole length between Hawkesbury River and Mount White. On section two, earthworks and bridge construction proceeded concurrently. One mile south of Mount White, where the expressway crosses the existing highway, twin bridges were constructed. These twin bridges over the existing highway were built without interference to traffic. At Mount White Interchange, a two-span reinforced concrete bridge was constructed to carry ramps across the expressway. This bridge was of concrete cast in situ on tubular steel false work. To keep water clear of the expressway, concrete drainage structures were provided. Catch drains were constructed along the tops of cuttings to lead water into natural water courses, which drained into transverse culverts located under the road. Longitudinal culverts were placed to carry water falling on the road clear of the carriageway and shoulders. Curbing and guttering were provided through cuttings to collect water and lead it through gully pits into culverts. Subsoil drains were provided to intercept subsurface water. Median drains to collect water discharged in the median area. and precast concrete drainage units to carry water down embankment batters.